Hey everybody, this is Brett Ingram, and this is the Optimize Podcast, the show that helps entrepreneurs build their dream business and dream life. So today we're talking with Donnie Bovine, CEO of Success Champion Networking, founder of the Badass Business Summit, top podcaster, and five-time best-selling author. He's a community builder at heart, and he's considered one of the leading global minds on sales, business development, and business growth. I'm super excited about this because I actually personally think networking and building relationships are vital to growth and success in business and in life. So with that, welcome, Donnie, and thanks a lot for joining us. Hi, hey, Brett. My honor to be on here, man. I, I, I look forward to it. This is my kind of people, my kind of conversation, so it should be a lot of fun. That's awesome. Yeah, I know. I know, you know I'm super excited to talk to you just because, uh, as we were talking about a little bit before backstage, uh, you know, networking and, and relationship building and stuff was not something I focused on early on. So uh, <laughs> I recognize now the, the the error of my ways, but so be it. So I know you're going to be sharing with us some pretty amazing tips and stuff, but I have to start off with your background. Can you give us a sense of just how you started in your career yeah, and sure. uh, and what your background is like? Yeah, so I'm a 25 year sales guy. You know, uh, I got out of the Marine Corps, jumped into sales, and uh, never looked back. Uh, you know, I turned 40 and heard guys like Gary V, people like Jen Sincero and Tim Ferriss all talking about this whole idea of being an entrepreneur. Um, and I didn't even know you could start your own company until I turned 40, right? <laughs> it's just, there's, and I have nobody in my family that was a business owner, entrepreneur. We're just a blue collar family. You work, you get a job, you retire. And, but those guys were talking about, you know, you can be your own CEO. And so I decided to make a bet on me and I jumped out and launched my company. Well, within 24 hours of launching the company, I was slapped with a non-compete that I never signed. Uh, so I worked for a large sales training organization. Supposedly I was one of the top sales trainers in the country. I don't know what that means other than really good at flapping my gums in front of a room, right? Um, and I was going to open my own sales training company. And now I couldn't. We did the legal battle. Um, they were going to bury me in paperwork. So I thought, you know, being a sales guy, I'll be able to figure this out. So uh, listeners should know that at that point, I built my dream farm. We built a second house on a property for my mother-in-law. We were living a kind of expensive lifestyle, if you will. Um, but now here I was. I went from making a great income to zero income on my own choice. Right. And now I didn't know what the heck my business was going to be. So uh, I figured being a sales guy, launching a company should be easy. This should be a cakewalk. So I uh, launched the company. Uh, didn't take me long before I had to cash in my 401k to kind of maintain the farm and that lifestyle. And then right around the six month mark, my wife's Jeep was repossessed. Uh, we almost lost the farm to foreclosure. Uh, graciously, she cashed in her 401k at that point um, and got her Jeep back and saved the farm. And we went from that mo moment to here now, uh, running the company and everything. So I love sharing the dark side of the business because I think everybody gets to see the Instagram story out there and everybody thinks that they're the only one screwing up. Everybody else looks like they're successful and crushing it and the likes. I always come at it from, let's have a real conversation about really how hard this is to actually build a company. Yeah, I actually love that. And I really appreciate the candor with it too. I, I feel the same way. You know, one of the challenges I had early on is, uh, is the vulnerability piece, right? Because you, you, when you look around, what you see is everybody who's supposed to be successful looks like they are and always were, <laughs> and that there was never any challenge. But when you start to pull back the curtain a little bit, and you look at the lives and you look at the backgrounds and the stories that most people have, most people um, that, that achieve some kind of success, especially in the business world, had a lot of struggles or problems along the way. And, you know, the value in all of that and sharing that is, is so other people know that they're not alone. Yeah. You know, if you look around and everyone around you seems successful, you're like, am I just like, am I an idiot? Like, do I not know what I'm doing? I mean, what's the problem here? Everyone else looks like they just set, you know, put up a shingle and all of a sudden they were millionaires overnight. Yeah. And the reality of it is, you know, as you and I both know, it's not quite that simple. It's never that straightforward a path. And so, um, so yeah, yeah, I think that's super important. So well, and one of the so things that helped me along with that uh, is, is, you know, I love autobiographies or, you know, uh, like Walter Isaacs is one of my favorite authors because he tells the kind of the raw side of the stories, like with Steve Jobs and Elon Musk. And you read those stories and you realize how much crap those guys endured 
to build yeah. the empires they they built. Um, and then you start getting in conversations with other CEOs and you start learning their stories. And, you know, I would be willing to bet that 75, 80 percent of every entrepreneur right now is one hiccup away from losing everything. Yeah. Um, you know, it's very, very, very small amount of people that are actually successful in running up a company. No, it's true. And, you know, you had mentioned Gary V earlier on. And it's funny because I actually had an opportunity to meet him and hear him speak uh, when he, before he was famous, right? Before right. he was successful. So he was a, you know, a kid that grew up in Jersey. His parents had a liquor store. So, I mean, I give the guy a ton of credit. He had a brilliant idea, but he was making YouTube videos for Wine Library yeah, TV. Yeah. And he was doing these basement like test, like taste testings. And, you know, he saw that niche where, hey, I could be like a common guy and talk about wine. I don't have to be snooty or arrogant or anything like that. Like I mean, typical... yeah, go back and look at those videos and see the difference in how we look back then to now. It's it's dramatic. Exactly. Right? <laughs> you know, but but the guy, you know, he put everything he had into it. He worked his tail off and he said, you know, I invested in my audience when they said mailed in stuff for email. Mm. I responded to every single email I did. But for a year and a half, whatever it was like, nobody even there was no traction yeah. and he kept going. So you got to give the guy a ton of credit. But it isn't like just because he's killing it right now. It was always that way. You know, he also. And so it's true. You 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 sort of pull it back a little bit and you see that um, that there's struggle. And so if, if if you're passionate about what you're doing, and you have a purpose for it and all that, then you can you can make it work, but but it is going to take work and there are going to be obstacles. So I'm curious from uh, from your background and, and from like where you came from to where you are, what made you focus on networking, sales, business development as really the core of, of sort of what you do? Uh, it was a fluke. So uh, as I was building the company in year one under that non-compete, man, and I, I, I was a business <laughs> whore. Uh, and literally I was launching companies just to try and figure out how to make a buck any way I could. And at one point I had like six companies going, none of them were really making any money, but you know, we were figuring it out. Um, and somewhere in the first year I launched a podcast production company because I had a podcast that took off. I got to interview some of the biggest names in the world. It was a lot of fun. Um, so I launched a podcast production company and that was doing well. And then my non-compete came up and I had such a chip on my shoulder from that non-compete that it was kind of like a hold my beer and watch this moment. Um, I went back, I launched a sales training company, went back and got most of my clients, you know, because I was just going to prove a point. Uh, and then right around two and a half years in, uh, we were getting ready to do the inaugural badass business summit. And I was running a very successful, you know, sales training company, a very successful podcast production company. And we were two weeks away from the event and COVID hits. Uh, all my business was online, so we were going to be safe there, but we had to postpone the event. And so uh, I was watching. I'm like, man, it took me two and a half years to build a legitimate online company. It was a lot of damn work. And I'm watching everybody else around. And I'm like, dude, they, they don't have two and a half years. They got 30 days if they're lucky to figure out how to transition everything you know, yeah. into a virtual space. I had run networking groups as I did the sales training um, company and, you know, and when I sold commercial printing, you know, I was selling B2B high ticket dollar, you know, services to people, you know, $50,000 print runs and, and the likes and, you know, $100,000 sales training and, and such. And traditional networking never worked for me back in those days. You go to a chamber of commerce and it was realtors, title, mortgage, all great people. But they could not introduce me to companies of, of scale, right? So I created all my own networking groups back in the day. So when COVID hit, I jokingly tell everybody I had that like Liam Neeson moment where I had a skill set and I knew how to use it. So uh, I didn't need the networking groups from a, like a revenue standpoint, but I knew it was a way I could keep people in business conversations. Um, and I was going, I saw Gary Vee go live every day. So I went live every day and I just kept telling him, you know, come to these networking groups, let's keep you in business and, you know, and the likes. Um, and we built uh, from there. And then we ultimately found the niche of straight B2B networking. And I didn't realize how big of a gap there was in the industry, um, you know, of people because most networking is centered around anybody in the industry can come. You know, we've been no MLMs from the get go, but 
uh, when we decided all in on B2B, man, it just took off. Uh, and so much so that uh, I gave the podcast production company to a buddy who essentially ran it straight into the ground. Uh, and I still bust his chops about today. We're still great friends. Uh, and then I sold the sales training company off. Uh, and now all I do is run the networking groups. Nice. So let, let's dig in a little bit on the networking side of things, because sure. um, as I mentioned on the onset, you know, it's one of the things that I struggle with. And I'll, I'll tell you why. I'm, you know, there are some people out there, I'm sure, that are listening, that are thinking, you know, um, I, look, I get that this might be important or whatever, but I, I got too many things to do in my business. I don't have time hmm. to build relationships and all this other stuff. I used to be that way myself. Um, as I got older and wiser, I realized that that was the piece that was missing in a lot of cases where I'd run into an obstacle and I, I had, you know, we're entrepreneurs. So we, we believe we can accomplish, we can like overcome whatever obstacle. Put a wall in front of me, I'm going to plow right through the damn thing. Yeah. Exactly. And so I'm like, you know, what do I need other people for? I'm just going to do. <laughs> and um, it wasn't until years later that I realized, well, geez, there's so many other people that have more answers than I do. If I just knew them, I wouldn't have had to struggle, but whatever. So, so the thing of it is, um, I do attribute it actually to one of the biggest mistakes that I've made professionally because I think it really held me back. But can you can you just give us um, sort of, you know, share your thoughts on the value of networking and relationship building as it pertains to, to business? Well, this is the way I look at it. Now, you understand, I come from a sales guy background, so everything kind of gets a sales hat put on it. But for me, networking is about building your word of mouth sales team. You know, if you look at it from that perspective, you know, uh, Jim Rohn back in the day, he's the one who coined the phrase, you know, the five people that you surround yourself is who you become. Well, what he didn't explain to people was it wasn't just those five really close people. It's wherever you are in that circle of five. So it's your five clients. It's your five prospects. It's your five networking buddies. It's your five friends. You know, all of that kind of contribute to, you know, who you're becoming. So taking the thought process of I want to be surrounding myself with people that are getting after it, doing amazing, powerful type of things uh, to also then encapsulate, man, if I find the right people that are selling to my ideal clientele but are not competition for me, man, I can build a massive word of mouth sales team because networking at the heart for me, if you strip everything aside, it's about helping people keep your name top of mind whenever the right conversations come up, right? And that's my sales spin on it. But yeah, in the same cool token, distinction. right, is, is you can get to anybody in the world through the network. This is a whole uh, six degrees of Kevin Bacon, six degrees of Kevin, you know, separation idea, right? And, and, you know, people look at these successful people and they go, God, it's amazing. They put them on this pedestal versus going, man, that guy's got a roadmap. How do I figure out the steps along the way? And then you leverage your network to get connected to the people that can help you retrace those steps and accomplish what they pulled off. Right. So I know that was a lot to unpack, but that's my overall theory behind all of this. No, I think and I think it's spot on. It's awesome because, you know, when I when I think about, you know, all of the, all of those kinds of things, when you think about people in any any sort of position, right? There's people that they know, there's people, there's things that they've done. When I, when I watch the, the show Shark Tank, the thing that occurs to me all the time is what you're doing is tapping into their network. It yes. isn't that any of the individual sharks are the genius that are going to take your business to where it goes. It's that they're going to connect you. They're going to yes. plug you in like a light switch to a distribution network or to a marketing network or whatever. And that's the thing that's that that's the key. That's the asset there. Not I'm not I'm not discrediting what they bring to the table, of course, but you know, one person in and of themselves is not going to be able to do everything. But if you're able to connect with the right people, and let's face it, we all know people in our lives that have gotten a job, that have gotten a, you know, found a spouse or a partner or yep. something through somebody else, through a friend, through a connection. Um, I have a, my older son is, is going to graduate college next year. And, you know, we see this firsthand, you know, he has friends that are you know, have families that are connected, they're already lined up with jobs before they even graduate, mm -hmm. all this kind of thing. And so the, the power of your network and who you know, obviously makes a big difference. But as you said, it's not just about knowing them, it's about would they would they put you in a position Would they think of you when they're in a position where they could do something that would be able to, to help you out as well. So 
Um, so funny story, I, I was early in my career and I was in staffing in the very beginning of my career. So it's basically a sales job, but we're, you know, we're selling uh, people, clients and candidates and everything else. So, um, and they always talked about networking and how important this was. So we'd go to these, you mentioned Chamber of Commerce, we'd go to the, the SHRM events, Society yeah. of Human Resource yeah. Management. And it was so funny to me because I'd go into these things and I was excited because I'm like, oh, there's going to be all these clients and HR managers there. And you walk in and first of all, it's 50% staffing yep. companies because they all know the same thing. And it's all these awkward, stilted conversations. We're in a small crowded room. Everyone's looking at name tags like, oh, are you a manager somewhere? Are you in staffing? And just so they're deciding who to talk to and who to pass by. And I'm thinking to myself, this just doesn't feel right. I mean, and it doesn't seem effective to me. I stopped going, even though people said I should. So what is your advice on how to network the right way? Yeah. I don't so think that's first it. of all, yeah, yeah, yeah. First of all, it's the wrong I, what, what cracks me up is, and I don't want to pick on realtors, I, you know, but realtors go to realtor association events. Like they're literally going to a room filled full of their competition, right? It makes absolutely no sense to me you know, uh, or why you would be in a room like that. So, so two things that, that will dynamically change how people network. If you're looking at it from strictly a business growth perspective is, is if you understand, especially if you sell business to business, like you're selling to other companies and I'm not talking about your solopreneurs, like you're selling to coaches and consultants like that. Right. I'm talking about if you're like a telecom company and you're selling into a company with 50 employees, right? Mm -hmm. When you think about from that perspective, companies that have like 50 employees, you're never going to see the decision maker of that company at a SHRM event, at a chamber event, at some random happy hour. They don't network like that. So the first thing you have to dynamically understand is your ideal clientele is not networking. So people are like, then why the hell would I network? Because you got to understand that all of those rooms, if you find the right B2B rooms and the right B2B places, all of those people are selling to your ideal client. Now you have to change the script in your head from instead of I need to convince them to buy my stuff is how do I get into their network? So you network to get to their network. And to do that, we have to understand that nobody is going to instantly say, here's my client list. Who do you want to meet? Right. It's just not going to happen. So now it's a matter of what can I do for them on a massive scale that one keeps my name top of mind and two has them want to bring my name up in the right conversations. So what I tell everybody networking on a B2B side of things is all about growing other people's businesses. Okay. So, so we have this thing called the synergy triangle and I'll try and describe it for your listeners where we'll put a triangle, we'll put you at the top of the triangle, whatever your industry is. We'll then put your best clients. So I always tell everybody like, well, let's do this live for them. It'll be fun. So, so Brett, what do you sell? We'll just do this live with them. What, what's your business and what do you sell? Software. Yeah. Software. Cool. Um, what's the first name of your favorite client? Just first name. I don't need no industry or anything like that. First name, your favorite client. Jim. Jim. Beautiful. Give me an industry that Jim is in. Uh, Jim is in healthcare. Beautiful. Cool. Uh, probably a company with 50 to 100 employees or small? A little smaller, but. Okay. Okay. All right. So now we think about, okay, we got a company, we got Jim. He's in healthcare side of things and he let's say he's got 25 employees. We'll just go fictional from here. Right. So now we got to think about who else would sell to a guy like Jim, like that would be their ideal target, but not competition for you. So what we do is we come up with an industry list. So now we got 25 employees. That means 25 computers, 25 phones. That means, you know, cleaning, that means trash, that means printing, right? And you start coming through all these ideas of what these other things will get sold to him. At the bottom of that triangle, you try and identify who are my top two industries that would be selling into him, but it's not competition. And what you do is what you do is you say, as you're out there networking is, hey, I sell soft software and you can do this with any industry, but we'll say just healthcare for now, right? In the healthcare, what I'm really looking to meet is anybody you know that's in telecom, anybody you know that's in IT, MSP, anybody you might know in cybersecurity, maybe websites, commercial printing, because what you're trying to do is you're really trying to build that word of mouth sales team, right? I'm not gonna know a, a guy who sells software 
in for who needs software in healthcare, right? I'm just never going to have that conversation, but I am going to run into several people that are trying to sell to that same person or have that client base, right? We all know it's easier to sell if somebody puts your name out there first, right? So if I got you to potentially like a hundred MSPs, you know, IT companies before the end of the year, how much impact could that likely have on your business? right? And it could be tremendous. So you change the philosophy to understand my clients aren't networking. So I'm going to network to get introduced to the people that are. So you start getting introduced to all these MSPs, all these telecom type companies, commercial printing companies. Now they're not going to open up your client list. So what you do is you start introducing them to each other. Now, so for instance, if I introduce you to say five MSPs, couple of telecoms, maybe a commercial printer, and then I said, hey, I specialize in working with healthcare companies, 25 employees. Um, do you know anybody in that space? I increase my odds of you making into the right introduction or the right referral for me um, in there because I've really narrowed down and got you to some ideal synergistic partners. Does that all make sense? Yeah, that's, that's, that's cool. I, I really like that. You know, because it does make logical sense, but I think so many people think of it as what's the direct approach. If I can't get in, you know, I, I need to meet the person that is going to write me the check or make the decision right off the bat. And it doesn't really work that way because it's hard, hard to get to those people. I know in staffing, one of the things that they used to do uh, when they did sales training is they would teach you all these techniques. So when you were calling in, you could get past, like if you were at a, a mid-sized yeah. company where it isn't, you know, three people in an office where they're going to pick up the phone anyway, you're, they're going to have an admin, they're going to have somebody who's screening yeah. calls or whatever. And they had all these tactics and techniques to get through. But even still, you know, to me, it always felt a little bit, there was something about it that just self, still felt salesy. Yeah. <laughs> I don't sure. like the idea because you, you're sort of, you're, you're not, I mean, tricking is a strong word, but you're sort of manipulating people a little bit to try to, and, and I, I never really liked that, but I, I like the idea of the network. And the other thing about what you said is because you don't have anything specifically to gain from the people that are you're, you're networking with initially, right, um, uh, on its surface, they're less likely to be resistant about wanting to get to know you or yes. you know work with you in that regard because you aren't asking them for anything really right 100%. I mean, you're, you're just connecting with them so yeah you know i mean if you think about it what the number one question anybody asks when they're out there networking is what do you do for a living right um and i love that question because now and it allows me to go cool who does this person need to meet so what what people need to get rid of is these stupid jingles and these little sayings and all this elevator speech crap because they mean nothing they don't do anything for you b2b is a long sales cycle right it's not a transactional hey you need a house Ooh, i can sell you a house right it's not a quick hit type thing right so it's a long so i understand that everybody i'm out meeting out networking they're not people that i'm trying to pitch to trying to sell to trying to you know, i need to build a lifelong relationship with these people right they may not run into anybody right now that it fits my world it's going to be over time so i need to do it so i love telling people like when you tell somebody what you do just tell them plain black and white i sell software cool your next question is a more important question which is how did you get into software Right? How did you get into telecom? How did you get into MSP? Because now it opens up a really cool dialogue and it lets them let their guard down because they don't know what the hell to say when they're out there talking to people. You just said, here, talk about yourself, the easiest thing in the world to talk about. And now they'll ramble on. And all they're doing is giving you information and go, oh, you know what? I have a couple people that are in telecom. I got a couple of commercial printers that I'd like to introduce you to, right? Other people that I think would be good synergistic partners for you. And it's an introduction. It's not a referral. Like a referral is an introduction with a sales call attached. Like, yeah. like somebody says, I'm looking for this service. This is just introductions. I'll do introductions all day long. And hopefully one of the introductions I introduce you to ends up being the person that can give you hundreds of referrals because you guys both build such an amazing synergy and you know, you're off to the races. This is the dynamic shift people have to make about networking as a whole. Yeah, I like that. I like that. I mean, it's definitely uh, when I, you know, what I learned about networking, at least um, when I was younger, was definitely the old school type. And I, I even had been at conferences where someone w um, who was an expert at networking would stand up and, and, you know, they had some cool 
introductory lines and stuff, but the, <laughs> but the process was always the same. And I, there was just always something inherent in me that it didn't didn't really jive with me. So I, I, I but it, so what you're saying makes a ton of sense. Well, and the reason that they didn't jive is if we traditionally look at anybody who taught networking over the years, they came from a transactional environment. So they came from insurance, financial advisory, real estate, you know, right? So everybody they could potentially talk to were a potential target. Like there's somebody who could say yes. When you sell B2B, none of that stuff works. Right. So it's a completely different philosophy. Our clients aren't networking, you know, and so once we run, understand that now it's who's my starting lineup? Like, who are the freaking 10 other guys or gals that I can put together that we just become this elite referral machine because we're all strategically going after the same client base, but we're not competition. Right now, this becomes my top person that I'm going to open doors for. So I'm going to listen very specifically for people that need software, right, or need telecom. I'm going to open up doors for them at that level because I know they're going to do the same for me. Uh, and this just dynamically changes. It's just crazy what happens when you change your philosophy about networking as a whole. Yeah, no, that's I mean, that's great advice. So. So what about the business owner that says, okay, I get, I get it, I'm sold, I get, understand the value of networking here, but I just don't have time. I mean, I'm so busy. How can, how can uh, business owners network more effectively and make it less time consuming? This is where I get to pull in a shameless plug. That's when you need something Absolutely. like Success, Champ Success Champions Networking. So we literally have B2B networking groups and they're virtual. So it's one hour a week, right? You're gonna do some virtual coffees here and there, but, uh, and we did that for that very reason. Like I have a full working farm in addition to running my company, right? So we have dwarf Nigerian goats on it, chickens, ducks, geese, the whole nine yards out here, right? So, and I'm out 45 minutes from downtown Fort Worth, Texas. So if I were to take a coffee meeting, a get to know you type meeting and drive into Fort Worth, I lose half a damn day. I'm not doing that. So I created virtual groups so I can sit here all day long having virtual coffees with people, right? In between running the company, doing the day to day operations, all the delivery, managing staff, all those type of things. And then I can pop a virtual coffee. And then once a week, I know I've got a networking group that I'm going to attend, right? I'm in there. It's one hour in and out, make some introductions, get some other things scheduled. But you're sitting right here cranking on your business, you know, and, and, doing a, basically a sales call. Cause I look at it when you have an elite team of people that get what your business is and they're working at the same level and pace you are, they're going to be getting into the right conversations to open the right doors for you. So, so get to the online space, but get to the, uh, the upper tier networking, like most networking out there. Like I have two barometers for me. One, if there's an MLM in the room, I'm out, right? I can tell you everything I need to know about that space. Uh, the second thing, is if I walk in and 90% of the room sells business to consumer, B2B or B2C, I mean, mm -hmm. I'm out, right? Because I can't provide those people value. And I don't want to network with people that I can't provide value, yeah. right? So I want to be able to serve them as well. So, you know, those are my two big things. So you need a B2B space and you need virtual just so you can run and gun. Nice. So, um, okay, so let's shift gears a little bit and talk about actual sales, because obviously mm -hmm. that's the tangible met metric that everybody wants to grow. So <clears throat> many people, when you, when you ask them to think about a salesperson, the image that's conjured, conjured up in their mind is maybe someone pushy or someone <laughs> slick, trying sure. to convince them to buy, right? Yep. Um, so how can we build genuine trust with prospects so we don't have to be that way or be seen that way if we're in sales? And I love the fact that you use, you use the word trust. Um, that's all sales is about, is building trust. So the first thing that I want people to understand is there's no such thing as closing in sales. Closing is for transactional business. So think financial advisory, cars, right? You have to close in those industries. B2B, there's no closing. There has to be closure. And it's a massive difference, okay? Closure means in every conversation, you have to close the conversation out. So you're either getting a yes to move forward in some degree. No, this is not something they want to do, right? Um, or like the significant next step of moving forward. So maybe it's yes, they're going to do business with you, write a PO to cut a check. Um, 
maybe it's a next step of, hey, we need to go do X, then we'll come back and do this. Let's convene at this time. The next step only counts if it's actually on both people's calendars and they know, and each party knows why you're meeting and or, or it's a no, right? And, and if you try and do what mostly is taught in sales nowadays, which is such a transactional world, B2C thing, and you try any of that crap in B2B, you're going to get your teeth kicked in, right? Because in B2B, you know, these guys and gals that are making decisions at companies, they're getting bombarded on a regular yeah. basis by companies come in there. And if you come in trying to fast talk, sweet talk, you know, jive, anything in there is part of it, you're going to get booted right out the damn door because they got too many decisions to make outside of, you know, whatever your service is. So you've got to play the long game here. Right. And understand those relationships like some of my largest accounts I ever sold when it like my largest account I ever had was Mary Kay corporate um, two million dollar account for me when I sold commercial printing. Right. That deal came over time and being introduced as if I think I got my first you know order from them six months after talking to them. You know, mm -hmm. so it's it's understanding that and you're just building amazing relationships. And uh, like Home Depot, when I landed them as a client, it took me four years to get that deal. And every time, and my first conversation with the the purchase buy, order guy, guy, you know, that's the, the purchasing manager. First conversation is, look, I know you got a printer. I know you probably got a couple of go to. How do I get to be number four? on the list like if those guys can't do it how can we number four and once we laughed at me and said okay four is good we'll put you there i'm okay with that right i would just swing by once a month and we talk about his kids we talk about their soccer we talk about anything we wouldn't even talk about printing he knew what i did there was no point in continuing to bring yeah. it up four years in I get a phone call. He's like, how fast can you get to my office? And I said, how fast do you need me there? He goes, now. And I <laughs> cleared my schedule and ran across town, right? I get there and I walk in the door and he throws a postcard and hits it in my chest. I said, okay. He goes, I need a million of those in 72 hours. I said, done. Uh, he goes, another printer just completely dropped the ball uh, and crapped the bed. I actually caught myself from not cussing. Um, and I need these done. No I said, done. And I called the president of the company. And I said, I need to clear a clear press. He goes, we, we don't have the space. And I said, yes, we do. Home Depot, a million freaking postcards. He goes, we'll make a space, you know, uh, <laughs> and they work multiple shifts to get it up and we got it done. But, you know, four years of swinging by having conversations, not talking business, forming a relationship yeah. to earn that trust. Right. So, yeah. so get your conversations to closure. Don't try and do all this and, and turn off most of the sales books, turn off most of the sales tapes, right? The, the answer for most people to find success in sales is 100 conversations with people that can say yes to you. If you'll commit to get into 100 conversations with people who will say yes to you by the end of the year, you'll learn how to sell your stuff. Because you only screw it up so many times before you start adjusting. Okay, maybe I should say it differently here. Maybe I should do it differently here. Right? Most people don't have a sales problem. They have a prospecting problem. You know, they just can't get to the conversations. So work more on prospecting than you would actually sales. Nice. So. Yeah, no, that's, uh, that's, you know, it's, it's a great um, story. I, I know, you know, even when I was in staffing, it was funny because I was um, riding and my boss would come around with us occasionally on calls. And um, I'll never forget because it was the day I realized I couldn't work for the company anymore. Um, we went into a sales call and I'm a Red Sox fan. And I, and I walked into um, one of my client's offices and I, you know, I knew her a little bit, but I had seen her a couple of times. So I walked in and the first thing I saw like a Mets picture or helmet or banner or something. And I said, Oh, you like the Mets? I, I can't do business with you. And I turned around and pretended to walk out and then, you know, we're just sitting talking and I'm, you know, talking about her kids and I'm looking around her room because she's got stuff there that matters to her. So I'm just making conversation human to human. Same, like you said, she knows yep. what I do. I offer yep. staffing services. I, don't, I mean, I don't need to give her a bullet point list. If she has a question about one particular thing or rates or whatever, she'll ask me that. So we get out of the call, you know, get out of the, the office. Um, and, you know, we had a really nice conversation. My boss turns to me on the way back to the car. He goes, you, you got to cut out all the small talk. They don't care about any of that stuff. He's like, we're there to sell <laughs> staffing services. I'm like, okay. <laughs> the minute you make it transactional, especially yep, in an over. overly competitive business, you're done. I mean, yep. in this business, I would call somebody and they would say, you're the ninth call I got today. And it was lunchtime. 
Yep. I'm like, the only thing that stands out is the relationship. If they want to hang out with you and go to lunch once in a while, they want to do business with you because it's a break from the monotony yep. of what they're doing at work. Yep. So um, that totally resonates with me. I'm, I'm with you there 100%. So um, I know that you talk about disqualifying prospects <laughs> as one of your things, uh, which seems counterintuitive. But, oh, yeah. Um, so obviously that's turning traditional sales on its head, but can you tell Absolutely. us about how that, that approach and how it works? Yeah. So I, I, when I launched my company, um, I knew one thing that I was bringing along for the ride. No matter what the company ended up being, no matter what I was going to do, I was only going to do business with people I'd have a cocktail with, right? That's just something I wanted because when you sell B2B, you are going to be spend so much time with that individual. You know, you're going to be in so many conversations. So, at, you know, would I have a cocktail with them with my first kind of disqualifier of people? Then I started putting other <laughs> things in there like, you know, uh, uh, you know, can they actually say yes to me? Do they have money? You know, and all these things in there by coming up with a series of disqualifications. Right now I can change the entire dynamic. It, 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 transactional sales says qualify them, right? Freaking dial them in and, and reel them in, blah, blah, blah for me. I'm just trying to figure out, do I actually want to do business with them? And now imagine how much that changes the dynamic of the conversation. You're not saying, let me tell you why I'm the greatest thing on the planet. We're the most amazing company. Almost every company out there is a flipping commodity nowadays, right? So you're, it's like when I sold commercial printing, everybody had the same presses. Everybody had sell it on the same paper, same ink. The only differentiator was me. Yep. Right. So, so it comes down to, and do I want to get this guy's phone call at 10 o'clock at night when they're mad about something? Right. Do I want to get, you know, uh, maybe be late to a dinner or something with my wife because I got to put out a fire with these guys or I got to help them on a project or something. Right. Do I want to spend this quality time with them? Like I'm not selling a, you know, a transactional thing. So by going in and changing the dynamics of do I like this person? Not do they like me? Do I like this person? Really shapes how the conversation goes. Because now I can go in and do the small talk like you're talking about and make fun of the Mets, that type of thing, which is huge in bonding and rapport, which most sales training does not teach. You know, and I don't do sales training, but I did for a number of years. But you got to be able to go in and connect with somebody. And if you come at it from that perspective of, is this somebody I want to do business? It takes you out of desperation mode. It yeah. takes you out of commission burn breath, right? It allows you to dynamically go in and check the boxes. Cool. Would I have a cocktail? Do they have money? Right? Can they make a decision? Is this even relevant to continue this conversation? Do I think this will eventually turn into a deal type of thing? Do I want to invest my time here? And now you just check the boxes as you go through the things. You don't have to worry about convincing, qualifying, all that crap. You're going to have just a fun conversation. Uh, it really changed and shift how I looked at everything. It's crazy because even thinking about it, being in that situation from that frame of reference changes the way you feel about it. Yep. You don't you don't feel as though I, I need to convince this person to, to do business with me. You're sort of like, well, we've got to decide mutually whether or not this makes yeah. sense, you know, yeah. and so it levels it as opposed to feeling like they're here and you're there and you got to try to. So, yeah, I, I think, um, you know, and I think psychologically for a lot of salespeople it would make them more successful just because when you come at it from a position of weakness or perceived weakness, you come across as desperate and people don't like desperate. Absolutely. <laughs> it's it's not, a, not a good color on anybody. So. No. And well, let's be also be honest, man, this is really hard to do when you're broke. So, yeah. so if your sales numbers are down, you know, you got sales managers, you got, you know, you're not hitting your mortgage or whatever else. I mean, this mindset is extremely difficult to pull off yeah. because every deal matters. So I tell people like, you know, early on in your business, it is okay to be a business whore, meaning dude, take the job, work with people yeah. that, that you wouldn't have a cocktail with to get yourself to a place where you can build the mindset to go, okay, now let's look around. Right. Yeah. Um, but yeah, desperation, you can see it coming a long mile away. Yeah. So let's talk about how you can help people. You mentioned already uh, one thing. I don't know if there's anything else. What programs, products, services do you offer? Where can we find them? 
Yeah, so the two biggest things is, well, I guess there's three. So we do a, a live every Monday where we interview our clients, put them in a hot seat, talk about their businesses and how we can help them. Um, we have Success Champions Networking. That's the B2B networking groups uh, that we're continuing to launch everywhere. And then we have the Badass Business Summit. So um, Badass Business Summit's coming up in September of 2024. Uh, it's our fifth annual. Uh, that summit is all about being in the right room with the right people and networking at a very, very, very high level. So it's not a traditional conference of desperation and let me wow you and sell you all my crap. We're actually pouring into like my coach will be there running our VIP sessions, working on people's businesses over lunch and breakfast and the likes. You know, Jerry's been on the Inc. 500 list. He sold a couple of companies, right? So he'll be there really working individually with all of our VIPs and their, and their, and their uh, businesses. So, um, but Follow me on LinkedIn. That's where I'm most active on the, of all platforms. Uh, love the platform. We, we literally added a zero to the bottom line of our company from the content and things we put out on LinkedIn. Um, so we've gone all in on there. But uh, really, the biggest thing you guys can do for me is if you've hung out on this show this long and you've really gotten any value out of this, do Brett and I a favor. Take a screenshot wherever you're listening or watching this and post it on social media and kind of talk about what are your takeaways. Tag Brett and I in it. And if I see that tag, I promise you, I will come call. I will come comment on it. I will show you love. But by taking that screenshot, it really helps Brett understand that this is the type of content you're looking for. This is more of the information you guys want, and it'll help him really bring you guys a lot more valuable show. So but this has been Perfect. awesome. Thanks a lot for that. I appreciate that. Absolutely. And I have one last question. I always come on. have to ask because come on. I think it's important. And that is, what's your number one tip for success as a business owner or an entrepreneur? Um, understand there's no such thing as failure. Uh, I truly believe that life is an experiment. And if life is an experiment, you don't really fail. It's just that way of doing it didn't work. So and it really changed my philosophy about how I was showing up. You know, there was often times in my life where I was worried about what people thought about me, how this would make me look and the likes. And when you wrap your idea behind this life is an experiment, cool, that experiment didn't work. What can I learn from it and go again? Right? What can I learn from it and go again and go again? And eventually you'll stop taking the punches to the face and figure out how to make the dang thing work. But don't worry, if you're an entrepreneur, you're gonna take you're gonna learn to dodge dodge that jab and then you're gonna hit with an uppercut, right? It's just the way business happens. You're gonna be amazing, awesome, this is the greatest thing ever. And the next day going, Why the Sam, how am I still doing this? Right? That's yeah. that's the part of being an entrepreneur they don't talk about too much, but that's the biggest thing. It's great advice. We, we've yeah. certainly all, all experienced that. <laughs> Probably more than we want to admit. Yeah. All right. So with that, it's just about time to wrap things up. I want to thank you again, Donnie, so much for sharing all your insights and great tips with us. Visit successchampionnetworking.com for amazing virtual business networking. Thanks for tuning in. And as always, remember, no matter what you want from your business in your life, don't compromise. Optimize. 